The other day we talked about different types of energy and how we can convert between them. So, for example, there's potential energy, which is a type of energy that something has based on its position. A car at the top of a hill, for example, has a lot of potential energy. We can release the, the brake on that car and push it rolling down the hill, and eventually that car is going to get more and more kinetic energy, which is a type of energy that something has if it's moving. There's also a type of energy called chemical energy, which is stored in, in the bonds uh, between atoms and molecules. And gasoline, for example, has a lot of chemical energy in it, and if we dropped a, a lit match into a big tank of gasoline, we wouldn't want to be any near, anywhere nearby. But what we do is we convert a lot of that chemical energy in the gasoline into thermal energy. Now, it's particularly important that you understand energy and how we can convert it. So if you're a little bit shaky on this topic, um, I'd really suggest you go back and look at uh, yesterday's lesson, or, or uh, the last lesson that we looked at, which was called uh, Energy Conservation and Conversions. Take a look at that, uh, and once you feel really comfortable with it, then, then go ahead and come back to this. Um, but if you do feel pretty clear with energy and how we can move from one form to another, let's go ahead and get started. We talked about thermal energy for a second. That's going to be the main topic of our, of, our, uh, of our lesson today. Thermal energy, when it flows from one object to another, we call it heat. Let's imagine that we've wrapped our, our cold hands around a hot cup of chocolate, a hot cup of hot chocolate. Let's think about the way heat is going to flow. Heat is going to flow from the hot cup of hot chocolate into our cold hands. And that's the way heat always flows. Heat flows from a hot object to a cold object. And the heat flow stops when the two objects are the same temperature. So after the hot chocolate has sufficiently cooled and it's warmed my hands and they're the same temperature, no heat flow occurs anymore. Because heat always flows from hot to cold, we would never see a situation like this. Imagine that you wrap cold hands around a, a steaming cup of coffee and found them getting colder and colder because heat was getting sucked into the coffee. That would never, never happen because heat never flows from a cold thing to a hot thing. It always flows from an area of higher temperature to lower temperature. Now, thermal energy is particularly important in chemistry because, after all, what would chemistry be if it weren't for, for huge explosions and big fires and everything? As a chemist, I get to do stuff pretty much every day that would make my mother shudder. So don't show her these videos. She, she'd come here to school, she, she'd pull me out of the room, give me a stern talking to in the hallway, and probably, let me, probably make me quit my job. So, so make sure she doesn't see these. Um, but all joking aside, um, safety is important to keep in mind. Um, I have a couple demonstrations planned here that are going to show us how thermal energy is, is involved in some reactions. Um, and these are going to be pretty cool, but I want to let you know that I've taken a lot of safety precautions. These are not things that, that you should do at home. Uh, for example, uh, I'm going to be wearing goggles, which are going to protect my eyes in case anything goes wrong. And in addition, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I've taken a lot of time to plan these demonstrations to make sure that they're, they're going to work out safely. Uh, and I've taken time as well to prepare the chemicals and so forth uh, so, that, so that nothing goes wrong. Uh, in addition, I'm going to be handling a little bit of acid in this first demonstration, so I'm going to be wearing gloves. And on top of that, I'm going to be performing the whole demonstration um, in this what's called a fume hood behind this piece of plexiglass, so that if anything does go wrong, which I'm not expecting it to, uh, the glass will protect me. In this first demonstration, which is one of my favorite to do, um, I've mixed a chemical called potassium chlorate uh, together with some common table sugar. We're basically going to see how much thermal energy a small amount of sugar uh, contains. I've mixed these two compounds together. They're both white grayish powders uh, in this dish here. And I'm going to just pour it out onto this, uh, onto this plate here. Spread it out so that more of it is, uh, is exposed to the air. That looks pretty good. Now, just like that, no reaction has happened. But if I put just one drop of sulfuric acid on here, we'll get the reaction to start. Let's get a little bit of sulfuric acid in here and take a look at what's going to happen.
that's pretty cool, isn't it? As you could see, when I added that sulfuric acid, a tremendous amount of heat was released from this reaction. This is what we call an exothermic reaction. Exo is a Greek prefix that means out or out of. And so when I added that little bit of sulfuric acid to the potassium chloride and the sugar, a tremendous amount of energy came out of the reaction. So an exothermic reaction is one which releases energy into the environment. Let's now take a look at another type of experiment that also deals with thermal energy, but in a slightly different way. We just saw an example of an exothermic reaction, one that released a, a tremendous amount of heat into the environment. Let's take a look at another type of experiment. What I'm going to do here is uh, add two compounds into this flask. What I have here is some, uh, some ammonium chloride. I'm going to pour that in. I'm going to mix it with, uh, with some of this barium hydroxide that I've just weighed out. We'll uh, let's get that in here. That yeah, should, be, should be just about enough. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to mix this stuff and stir it together. Now, it's difficult for you to see, but this is becoming sort of more and more liquid as I stir around. But there's another change that's taking place. This is getting very, very cold in my hand. Let me show you what I can do. I'm going to put just a drop of water onto this board here and stick this bottle right on the board like that. I'm just going to let it sit there for a second. Now, we don't really have enough time for this to work, so I already did one ahead of time, just like a cooking show. Let me show you what eventually happens, though. As you can see, the board is completely stuck to this flask because the solution in here has gotten so cold that it's been able to freeze the water and freeze the board right to this flask. This is what we call an endothermic reaction, and it's the opposite of an exothermic reaction. In an endothermic reaction, the reaction that's going on in this flask is sucking heat in from the environment. Endo is a Greek prefix that means in or into, so it makes sense that an endothermic reaction is one that sucks heat in from the environment into the reaction mixture. So that's why an endothermic reaction often feels cool because it's sucking energy, for example, out of our hands. Now, let's go back to the classroom, review these concepts, and see how we can use some mathematical and graphing techniques uh, to understand these ideas in a little greater depth. In order to look at exothermic and endothermic reactions in a little bit more depth, we've got to define a few new terms. The first of these are the idea of system and surroundings. They're not particularly tricky concepts, but they pop up almost any time we want to talk about thermal energy and, and thermal energy transferring between different things. A system is anything that I choose to focus my attention on. So for example, if there's a, a reaction that I'm interested in in this beaker, I can consider the beaker to be the system and everything else surrounding it, the whole rest of the universe, is considered the surroundings. If I'm interested in a particular cow I feel, I can consider that cow to be my system and everything else in the universe is his surroundings. Well, how does this re relate to the reactions that we looked at? I did an example for an, of an exothermic reaction for you. I said that it created a huge amount of heat that it let out into the environment. This is true, but a more precise way to define an exothermic reaction would have been to say that an exothermic reaction releases heat from a system into the surroundings. And these red arrows here show the direction of heat transfer in an exothermic reaction. In the demonstration that I did, the system was that little pile of chemicals that I had on the plate, and the surroundings were, were everything else, but most noticeably, the, uh, the air close by, because I could actually feel that air getting hot because of the heat being transferred to it from the system. On the other hand, an endothermic reaction is one in which thermal energy is transferred from the surroundings into the system. The second demonstration that I did, uh, the flask was able to freeze the water that, was, that it was placed on uh, because it was pulling heat energy out of that water because the water was part of the surroundings and, and into the reaction that was going on in the flask. Let's now take a look at how we can use some graphing techniques to, uh, to better understand the ideas of exothermic and endothermic reactions. Um, but before we do, there's another vocabulary word that we have to define. This is the term enthalpy. 
Enthalpy is one of those terms that like, like dating or, or going out, it's a lot easier to understand than it is to define. A textbook would probably say that enthalpy has to do with the heat content of a particular system. But enthalpy isn't so much about whether something is hot or not, or what its temperature is, although that is slightly important. It's more about its potential to create heat. It's about a system's, it's about the amount of energy that's in a particular system. So, for example, a log has a lot more enthalpy in it because it's able to produce heat more than, for example, ashes are. At the same time, a heat pack that we haven't yet used has more of a potential to create heat than that heat pack after it's, after it's released its heat and after it's finished with the reaction. So let's look at a graph of enthalpy um, and see how it changes during a particular reaction. Let's first look at an exothermic reaction. Here's my graph, and I'm going to put enthalpy on my y-axis here. We often use a term H, the letter H, to denote enthalpy. And enthalpy increases as we go up the y-axis. So burning a log would be a really good example of an exothermic reaction. We said that relatively speaking, a log, because it has a high potential to create heat, has, has a pretty high enthalpy. So let's put it up here. After we've burned that log, we get a variety of, of products. And we get carbon dioxide and water and, and ashes, because combustion of a log is, is rarely complete. So that's why we get the ashes. These don't have as much of a potential to create heat as the log did. So they have a lower enthalpy. So I'm going to mark them down here. Here we have CO2, water, and ashes. In science, we're often concerned about the change that has taken place during a process, the difference between the beginning and the end. And scientists have a very fancy term for this. They like to use the Greek letter delta to talk about the change. In this particular reaction, I'm interested in the delta H, or the change in enthalpy that takes place from the beginning to the end of the reaction. Now, the reactants had a pretty high enthalpy. The products have a pretty low enthalpy. So let's look at how this changes. Enthalpy in this case doesn't go up, it goes down. So I can say that this has a negative delta H for an exothermic reaction because it's giving off heat into the environment. If this is a tricky concept for you, let's use an analogy with money. Let's imagine that we're really rich, so we have a, a high starting value for the amount of money that we then we go and we spend a lot of money putting that energy into our environment the same way an exothermic reaction releases heat into, a, into its environment. So we go and we spend money on everything that we see. We, we buy sunglasses on the street, we buy Louis Vuitton handbags, we buy newspapers, we give money to everybody who's asking for spare change. Because we're giving out all this money, what happens is the amount of money that we end up with is lower than the amount that we started with. So because of that, we could say that our delta money, the change in the amount of money that we have from the beginning to the end of the process, is a negative value. Same thing happens with here. It's a negative change in enthalpy value because all that heat was released to the environment. Now, let's take a look at a graph of an endothermic reaction. We'll set this up the same way. Put my by enthalpy value right there. An endothermic reaction is, is in, in, in many ways the opposite of an exothermic reaction. A good analogy for an endothermic reaction would be someone who goes and, and, and tries to steal as much money as they can. So they're pulling money out of the environment and they're holding on to it, they're keeping it for themselves. So somebody who starts out without much money but then, then steals it or takes it from their environment ends up with more energy, with, I'm sorry, with more money at the end than they had at the beginning. An example of that chemically might, for example, be a cold pack. A cold pack feels cold because there's a reaction taking place in it that's pulling in energy from the surroundings. If that cold pack happens to be placed on your skin, it feels cold because it's, it's pulling heat out of your skin. A cold pack starts with a relatively low enthalpy. So we'll put it down here, cold pack. But during the process of an endothermic reaction, as we said, 
thermal energy is being pulled in from the surroundings, and then the cold pack, the chemicals in that cold pack, hold on to that heat energy that they've pulled in. So because of that, they raise the amount of enthalpy that they have in them, because they're pulling it in from the environment. So at the end of the reaction, a cold pack has more heat energy inside of it than it had when it started. So we'll put used cold pack up here. Again, we're interested in the change in enthalpy, or the delta H of this reaction, whether it goes up or whether it goes down. In this case, as we can see, our products that we end up with have more enthalpy than our reactants. So the change in enthalpy from beginning to end, or the delta H of this reaction, has a positive value. Endothermic reactions have a positive delta H, and exothermic reactions have a negative delta H. Be sure, that you, uh, be sure that you understand this and you understand the graphs uh, and the terms uh, uh, before you go on. This is really important stuff and we're going to keep coming back to it for about the next week or so. So if you're a little bit shaky on what you've seen so far, just go ahead and rewind this um, and watch it again. Uh, if you're set, let's go and finish the last thing that we're going to talk about today.